Web3 enables a unique opportunity to better evaluate the traffic that's coming to your website in a way yeah. that wasn't as possible for just like normal traffic for Web2. Welcome to W3G, the official podcast for myasin.xyz and your go-to hub to learn the latest developments in growth and marketing in the wild and wonderful world of Web3. I'm Julie Octaviano. And I'm Blake Minaho Kim. Tune in each week as we talk to the best and brightest and keep uncovering insights so we can all grow together in the world of Web3. Today, we'll be speaking with Justin Vogel, co-founder of Safari, a leading community for Web3 growth leaders, as well as a fast-growing tech product solving for attribution in Web3. Justin has a long background in product and growth, and he's one of the most thoughtful people we know about understanding where we are in Web3 and how to analyze and tackle growth in this new and emerging frontier of the internet. We had a great time nerding out with Justin about Web3 growth and community, interest in growth hacks and tooling, the importance of attribution, and our predictions for where Web3 growth will be in the next several years. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here's episode number six with Justin Vogel. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. I feel like this is really long overdue. You know, Justin and I, we've been talking since early 2022, but, you know, for our audience, we always love to kick things off with background and origin stories. So Justin would love to learn and, you know, have you tell, you know, our listeners a bit more about your background, you know, how you ended up starting so far, where that initial idea come from, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. So my whole background up until the point at which I dove into Web3 as a founder was all in growth. So I'd worked for several early stage and growth stage marketplaces doing both Community-led growth at the time was what, one of my first jobs at the secret sauce of our business, but we didn't call it community-led growth back then. This was in 2018 times, and then went on to a larger marketplace built leading all things programmatic advertising and building their first experimentation platform. And when I dove into Web3, I was really fascinated with how are Web3 companies going to grow now in, in the future? Because that leaned heavily on my background. And I was really surprised that nobody was talking about Web3 growth. It seems like we're in a very different state now where everyone's obsessed with Web3 growth and how they're going to get their company to grow. But yeah. that wasn't the case in the bull market, right? Nobody cared how their company grew because they were all growing. And yeah. they're growing like crazy on an unprecedented scale. And so... Yeah, my bet, my, you know, interest in Web3 came from those early fascinations, but how mm -hmm. Web3 really started came from a challenging place for myself too, is I had been exploring and becoming really active in many DAOs and different communities, but I didn't feel like I had found my community. And mm -hmm. it was sort of December, 2021, I was really reflecting on like, what is, what would the community that I want to be a part of look like exactly? And it was through that that I started coming up with the idea for Safari and reaching out to other Web3 growth leaders and saying, this is something that I, I, I want. Is this something that you would want too? And people, the resounding answer was like, yes, there needs to be a Web3 growth community. No, no Web3 growth leaders even knew each other. They're also yep. practitioners. They wanted other people to talk to about Web3 growth and the immense challenges that they were having at growing their companies. And yeah. so it really started from those early conversations. I had this thought, I wanted to create a community for myself. I talked to 10 other Web3 growth leaders. They said it was a great idea. Yeah. I tweaked some things and then we launched. So I just posted on my LinkedIn, hey, you know, a group of us are starting this Web3 growth community. It's going to be an initial batch of 40. Applications close in four days. If you're interested, apply. Boom. And we were very surprised to see that well over 150 people applied in those four days. Which it. was shocking to me because I was a complete unknown in Web3. Like I had been in the space two months, I had zero credibility. I didn't know anyone, nobody knew me, and yet everyone wanted to join this Web3 growth community. And that really kicked things off from there. Nice. I'm curious, how did, so, so you said Safari started December 2021. That's um, when I conceived of the thought. All right. Oh, okay. So then when was, I guess, when did you start having those conversations? When did you get that hundred plus group of people together? Was that like early 2022? Yeah. So the, the community launched the first week of February and oh. I had started having those conversations with growth leaders like a week or two into January of last year. And it was a quick turnaround from like thought to launch in about a month. That's amazing. I guess a two-part question. One, out of curiosity, how did you corral all of these people? I know you weren't expecting so much interest in the influx, the volume. Was it Discord? What sort of tools, communication tools did you use to curate this community based on 
all that interest. And then over the past year, I guess it's been officially about a year. How has Safari evolved as you have, you know, grown this community and had these group of amazing people join? Has it, has it evolved in a specific way? So would love to kind of like hear about the overall evolution from conception to today. Yeah. So when we started building Safari, there were a few things on my mind. One, a lot of the communities that I had joined at that time were really poorly run, to be honest. And I tried to dissect the reasons and why they're poorly run. There are a few different things I saw. One, people were like trying to maximize, get as many people as possible into their community. And I was like, this seems like a, just a management disaster. Like it's yeah. too hard for like a small group of people to try and manage like tens of thousands of people. That's just like on an unprecedented scale. And I was like, I, I'm creating this community for myself. I didn't really know where it was going to go, but I was like, I have to create a community that only I can like manage in the beginning yep. days, whatever that looks like. And so it has to be easy and simple enough. And I, and I cannot manage like thousands of people. So it needs to be small. And if it's going to be small, it needs to be closed. Not anyone can join at any time. And it, that sort of initial structure helped start to shape this initial concept. I would love to say, looking back, that I had all this like planned strategically and that like, you know, this was always the grand plan. I just looked at what everyone else did and said like, no, they're doing it wrong and I'm going to do it right. But no, I just, I just looked around and I was like, I don't like the way that communities are run. Let's try it. Just try and do the opposite of what everyone's done. Just piece by piece. Everyone's doing open. I'm going to do close. Everyone's doing a bajillion members. I'm going to do a very small group of people. I yeah. was doing text, which was on Discord, which is super hard to manage. You have to moderate. You have to be part mm -hmm. of every single conversation. I was like, we're going to do audio. So we have an audio-based Discord still to this day, which is very different from how a lot of people do it. Um, they wanted people to maximize their spending time in their Discord. I said, no, we're just going to have one call, one hour every week. That's how you engage in Safari. You can talk about whatever else you want to talk about in the Discord, but I set the expectation from the beginning. This is how we're going to run Safari's community. And all those things, it turns out, one, made, made it so much easier to manage that type of community that like a sprawling yep. thousand person Discord where their conversations going on on all sorts of topics all the time at all times of day. And two, it actually created a better member experience. It's a lot more fun to be in a small group of 40 people that all care about the same thing and come from the same type of background, which are like web three growth leaders or early stage founders than it is to be in a thousand person community where people you can talk about anything out of the sun. Chaos, man. Too many <laughs> notifications all over the place. Too many discord groups. It's, it's the right approach and I've really enjoyed it so far. I love to dig a bit deeper into kind of like web three growth and marketing in general, right? And I think this is something we've been talking about with the course of the past year, right? Obviously there are some major differences with web two and web three marketing. We love to get a little bit more tactical in terms of, you know, we talk about community all the time. We talk about web three direct community, but with that in mind, I would love to kind of get, you know, allow you to kind of show your, your wares in terms of community frameworks, right? So when we think about you know, how this is all evolving, right? As cookies die out, as Facebook and Google become less relevant. And as we start to move towards a more community oriented kind of marketing, have you been thinking about it? How do you think your views have evolved? I, I think is really interesting because I feel like that really, that narrative really started to pick up, I feel like early last year. And then we've seen a lot of things happen since. And we realized like, Hey, maybe community isn't like you just said, like throw 10,000 people on a discord and that's community. Like it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Right. So. We'll love to hear where, where your head's at with that today. I think that the, the scale question will always be a question. Yeah. I actually think that I've learned that community is really great for certain types of businesses and maybe not mm. the, the types of businesses that it was being used for in Web3 in the past. So primarily, what for those who are, who are listening, a lot of the communities that we're talking about were NFT communities. So these That's were right. primarily like B2C communities at targeting, they need to target a large group of people in order to make their, their collection successful. I think that there will still be elements of this that we'll see at scale. And we see this in other areas, especially with like China, with WeChat marketing, of yeah. like creating these groups that do certain things and they're able to do it at scale in the millions. But for now, I think that 
I'm, so I'm a B2B founder. I think that there is huge, huge value in creating a community for a B2B company because the mm. scale is so much different, right? Like you can, as a B2B business, you might only need to have relationships with 500 people, right? Mm. At a reasonable scale, even, right? You can be yep. making millions of dollars with hundred customers, maybe 200 yep. customers. And so you can have a 200 person community of like Safari is a 300 person community from 200 yep. companies that could very well sustain us for a long period of time, building those relationships. And since they're coming inbound with a different value prop, you have, yep. you know, the opportunity to develop a relationship with them, which is what we have sales teams doing in web two all day long. Yep. They're trying to call people that don't want to talk to them. And it's a ton of time versus I'm able to build high quality relationships at scale with people who do want to talk to me. And that helps build relationships for the product that I ultimately want to sell them at whatever point in time it becomes relevant in their life cycle. And so I think that we do a lot of things at yeah. scale in web two in the B2B space to try and achieve the exact same outcome that I'm achieving for a lot yeah. less work with a lot fewer people by a community. And I think that some of those nuances will continue to evolve when we think about community-like growth and which businesses yeah. it works best for. I love that. One of the things we were like riffing off of communities and, and Web2 brands who dove into Web3 and created actually like very successful Web3 communities out of it. And she was like, it's like a digital country club where it's, you know, kind of like an exclusive membership, but you you get to... It's very, very exclusive, top tier, networking with one another, providing val a mutual value to one another. And I definitely think that's the direction we're heading in the future, yeah. our generation. I think it's becoming more and more normal mainstream than physically being a part of some sort of membership where you go to a location or you play golf with a few buddies and, and you exchange contacts or, you know, business that way. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. I wanted to, so I, I want to ask the next question, but before I do, going back to the actual evolution slash membership, you kind of mentioned, I think you have about 300 members from 200, -ish, I think you said different companies. What, in terms of globally, what sort of patterns or segments are you seeing within the community? Is it mostly US-based? Do you find that your members are pretty global or mostly Western. And yeah, I guess I, I'd love to. Oh, and then the other question was, do you guys, is, I guess even in the early days, did you guys get together in real life? I know within Myosin, we have kind of like set groups of members within the DAO that are in certain cities and we kind of get together amongst ourselves. So love to know more about that side of things within the community. Definitely. Yeah. So Safari has been extremely global from the very beginning. And this also shapes, is shaped probably by me and my co-founder are global. My co-founder is from Paris and is nomading around all over the world. And I'm here in San Francisco, but a lot of our community, and I think most communities get shaped by the first group of people that are in them. And so oh, it's the, one of our, a couple of our key members were at the time for very first batch were the head of growth at Ledger. He's based in Paris. I've seen a ton of Web3 growth leaders emerging out of Paris. I don't know if that's because yes. Ludo was one of sure. our initial members. Yeah. And now my like attention is very tuned into the, the Paris yeah. Web3 growth space. But I also think there are a lot of great Web3 companies in Paris. So rare. It's a pretty good tech gathers. ecosystem over in Paris, I feel like. Yeah. Totally. Web2 or Web3. Yeah. Yeah. And so then we also had the VP of growth at CoinMarketCap, who's based in Singapore. So that sort of created these like regional hubs from the beginning of like, you know, Europe, Asia, and the US and kind of like expanding networks from there. And in the like third batch, we saw all these like people from Canada starting to emerge. We have other people in Europe. So I forget what the tally is now, but it, at some point it was like 30-ish countries is where our, our members hail from in Africa as well. That's the cool thing about Web3, you know, people are everywhere and come from everywhere. But that does create, you know, time zone challenges. And also meeting up is a lot less natural for our community as a result, yeah. because people are from everywhere. That being said, the sort of like breakthrough moment for me and like, what is Safari in this community? What does this exactly mean? Was at NFT NYC last June is we created a telegram group. There are some people who said that they were going to be there. The telegram group like started to grow and grow. Uh, of like 
from specific Safari members. So at the time we were 200 and I was like, you know, I'm gonna host something in Bryant Park, just super casually, maybe like three to four people show up. At that point in time, I had only met probably of the 200, like two to three people in person who were like in San Francisco. So most of these people were like digital interactions. And we actually had well over 20 people show up at NFT NYC to that specific meetup. And I was just like floored. I was like, we have like 10% of our community here at this one time in a place that I don't live either. I'm not in New York City. Yeah. There are people from Asia, they're from Europe, they're from the States, they're from lots of other places. And they all like came out because they like love Safari for this like one meetup. And as you know, like, and like Web3 conferences are total chaos. There's yeah. so much to do and so much going on. So that was like, I feel like a real turning point for me as a community builder to be like, oh man, like this is a real community. Like yeah. I thought it was, but like, I feel like when you meet up in person, people want to spend time with you. Like that's real validation when you can take something that was digital to physical and back again. Totally yeah, and I, agree. And I, and I feel like com with conferences, it's like, that's going to be, I mean, it already is, but essentially like, you know, we're, we're finding the same thing for ourselves. It's like, because membership is not restricted to any one geography, like conferences kind of become the de facto gathering point for so many different, whether you're an NFT community, whether you're Safari, Myosin, the DAO, any type of community, right? Like it's, especially of like, we're, we're in still somewhat of a pretty niche free right now. Right. So it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I'd love to better understand. Right. So I think what we can do is we'll kind of go back and forth between kind of what's happened with Safari and we'll get tactical and we can go back and forth, but I'm really interested in kind of, I don't know. I think I just want to nerd out and just get tactical. Right. But we'll love to talk about a bit more of you know, with the members and we're talking about different growth challenges and different things that people are seeing, obviously, like, because we're in a bear market, like you said, growth doesn't just come or naturally, it's not just you release a thing and it just immediately moons. And I think that's when people like growth leaders, and marketing leaders really have our opportunity to shine. What have you been seeing as some of the most interesting, like things that come on top of mind, right? Like most interesting kind of case studies of here's a problem that someone was facing or most common problems, maybe. And then like the most interesting kind of like growth hacks or tactics that you've seen that, you know, people put together within Safari and whatnot. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are several, there are so many challenges that growth leaders face in this very unique environment. Uh, yeah. One of the ones that I think most growth leaders feel very acutely is that the growth strategies that they use saturate so quickly to historical growth strategies. Like I'd say probably on average, most companies have a couple of different growth channels that work really well for them. And they work yep. really well for them for probably on average two years. And then they right. start to saturate. But in Web3, it's like three months. It's like you've yep. done the same thing. It works. It works for three months and then it's dead. And you have to come up with something totally new for a market that is changing just as quickly. Same. The, the growth professional front, I think that that plagues people and you have to constantly yep. be more creative, understand, have like deep market intelligence to see how things are shifting and yeah. shift right at the right time with a new growth strategy and be ready to go. So be very dynamic. Yeah. And so that leads, I think that you know, I've seen some of the best growth in my entire career in Web3 yeah. for this reason, because that's, that's what it takes to survive as a growth leader in this space. In terms of their tactical, in terms of their actual challenges, it's a lot around the onboarding flow and the collection mm -hmm. of data or the not, not collecting data. Yeah. Because anyone would just join anything. Anyone can mint anything, right? Yeah. And we've seen that it's been so fascinating to see this evolve amongst Safari members just in the last year. Like in January of last year, people were talking about, okay, I have this connect wallet login, but like, should we, should we ask them for their email right afterwards? I don't know if that's like, not like yeah. ethos and like privacy, maybe we shouldn't collect their email. And then like a couple months later, it was like, okay, no, we're definitely going to collect their email afterwards. Yeah. Okay. So like we can contact them. And then from there, it's like some people did a flop right on there. Like yeah. we're going to do it. Google authorization, and then we're going to connect it to their wallet afterwards so that we can have a web two sign in flow versus the connect wallet. And so I think that my big feeling, you know, the, the only thing I needed to believe when I started this community was that web three growth leaders are going to have an outsized impact on web three overall. And I think that yeah. it's, that remains to be the case in these types of decisions, right? Yeah. Is that if all the web three growth leaders decide the wallet sign in doesn't work for them, then that has a massive impact on 
Web3 yeah. has developed into the future and it's not working for them. And so a lot yeah. of people are doing different types of things, either collecting more information on the back end, which yeah. is what the front end of their onboarding flow looks like, using Web2 tracking tools to, with a very Web2 yeah. flow because the alternative doesn't work for them. And so I think it's constantly the, the big challenge that Web3 growth leaders are, conti are continuously toggling with is how do I present the best of Web3 while still yeah. having a flow that allows me to do my job in a meaningful way under yeah. the craziest of conditions that any Web3, any like growth leader yeah. will ever experience. And I think that that's, that's constantly the inner workings of Web3 growth leaders because they really do yep. believe in the ethos. They're bit here for that reason specifically. Yeah. But I think we, for, for most of the bull market, most projects, because you just launch a moon, they didn't need data. They didn't need to yep. to worry about these things as much because people are willing to go over the hoops for speculative value or because they really just appreciate the space. And that's not as much the case anymore. And so I think that is why people are, are reverting back to more Web2 style onboarding flows and tactics. Do you think, I mean, this is something I, I think we think about all the time here at Mice as well, which is like, there's this, I mean, we, even when we talk Web3 and Web2, right? Like it's such a small space still, right? And it's such a chaotic space and it changes all the time, right? Which, which I agree with. But do you think maybe there's a world where I guess, you know, we need to start thinking bigger, perhaps it's like, because I think what you're, we're, we, what I'm getting from everything you're talking about, right? It's like there's this inherent challenge between Web3 growth and Web2 growth. But if this thing is ever going to go mainstream, I mean, I think the view that we have, and I think most of us have, and probably you as well, is like these things need to actually just be internet, right? <laughs> That's the future of the internet. So, I mean, I don't know if there's, I guess it's kind of an open-ended question. It's like, it's the state of the nation and, and where we are today it's still so nascent, but I'm just curious on like what your outlook is on in terms of the tooling and the, and the products and the way we think about being true to web three ideals where it's like, oh, people want to say totally anon, but honestly, I think in our experience and probably yours and many others as well, it's like generally people, yes, like we want to respect privacy and we, we want to not target them with a bunch of ads, but at the same time, the company is going to grow and truly understand its customers. You also have to, there's a give and take, right? And honestly, we find that it seems like, in my experience, like most people don't really care that much. So how are you feeling about that in general? Say the nation and the tooling and products and the role they play to help transition. Yeah. To start on your last point, because I think it, it shows yeah. a lot of this is that we exist on this continuum between privacy maxi and all out data mining maxi. And I think Web2 has got, as we know, has gone way too far to like the all out yeah. data mining. Like we we're on that end. And then yep. three during the bull market was like, you collect no data, you don't do anything. Yeah. But I think that there is a happy medium in the middle yep. of, you know, being able to understand the basics of users and be able to personalize their experience accordingly, yep. uh, but not being like, I want to know everything about what Blake or Julie does in their whole personal life, everything about them, all the things that they ever will, will or, or won't buy as we did in web two. So I think that there is like. The, the thing that gets me really excited about Web3 and Web3 data in terms of this direction that we're talking about is I think that as a marketer, we really want to know what people do. And in Web2, we haven't had access to that information because transactions are, are private and our identities are public. And so we've been using all the things about who you are to Demo. predict what yeah. you do. Which yeah. Mm. But then we were able to, through third parties and et cetera, at Web2, figure out, okay, all the things about who you are and what you do to predict what you do. But I, I would like to believe that there is a world in which it doesn't matter who you are and we get to know everything about what you do. And that helps us predict alone what you'll buy so that there is privacy preserving. It's not you. It actually isn't you. And we're not collecting information about you. But we do know what you do, which helps us build models for what you yeah. will do, want to do or buy in the future. See, this is really interesting because I think it kind of, for me, brings up almost like a sort of philosophical point of view, but it's more like a, thinking about the state of blockchain, right? And the fact that everything is on a public ledger, but you know, you know, Aztec network and uh, like that they're building the privacy. So for people who may not be aware, Aztec network, you can go find them on Twitter or Google. They're building a privacy layer on top of Ethereum. I think currently it's DeFi focused, but they just raised a huge amount of money to kind of build out a new layer on top. But I do think about kind of the future of blockchain where, yeah, everything's public today, but will it always be public? And then what happens when things are private 
again, right? Because it's like, if we're, if you believe kind of like, I'm sure we all do, like eventually like our health records should be NFTs, our, our bank accounts or our finance, our actual day-to-day financial transactions, not just the NFTs I'm trading, like my paychecks and everything will be stored as NFTs in some form or another. I don't want the whole world to see that, right? So there, it's kind of like, like you said, there's this continuum and I'm curious about, and again, nobody knows the future, but I'm just like kind of putting it out and would love to get your reactions to that. But it's like, how do those things balance, I guess, right? Like as we move towards this world where it's public, but things are going to become more private one day, I would bet, right? Like it can't all sit in the, for everyone to look at forever. So I'm just curious how you think, how you feel about that, right? Any thoughts on I think for me, and this is a space that I'm starting to get much more intrigued in, but and certainly not an expert, so I can't tell you more than what I'm about to tell you, yeah. is I'm becoming very fascinated by wallets. I think that wallets yeah. shape all of these questions. Everything, yep. everything that Web3 in the future will be based off of whatever happens with wallets. Mm. And I think that for me, right, like what we're talking about here is some people say wallets should be our identity and that our identity oh, yeah. will be formed through our wallet. And other people are like, well, maybe, maybe that's not the right take. A wallet should just be a better way to transact money and buy things yeah. than it is today. And it's not. And then what happens when you have multiple you... wallets, right? Yeah. It's, and maybe you have yeah. an identity wallet and maybe you have a payment wallet yeah and maybe that's where we end up right but i think that mm. it is far-fetched to me to believe that i feel like consumers always want something to be private and are okay with other things being public and yeah. so if we're going to say like it's going to be both your identity and all your transactions and everything's to be public that's far-fetched to me but i think that either we go one of two ways right it's like you are not you and all your transactions are public or like, yeah. this is your identity, but your transactions are now privacy preserving. They're built on ads text. So you can't see them. It's just your identity yeah. and not your transactions. I don't think that we get both. So I think that while it's in conclusion, will define everything based off of which way they go, whether it's identity yeah. or payments, but I, I don't believe that it will be both. Maybe there'll be two types, right? Who knows? Or, or that you have yeah. two types and they're separate. Yeah, man. Yeah. And then I bet yeah. people build like meta layers to aggregate on top of it. I don't know. I'm just like, oh, for, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The identity stuff is yes, an entire rabbit hole you could go down and we can only speculate at this point, but I guess we'll see how, how it ends up panning out. But it's, it's super interesting thing to speculate on because it's going to affect all of us and, and everything that we're we do. We're going to build it together, you know? Yeah, we're all building it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I want to actually bring it back to Safari. So why don't I kind of give you the podium to talk about what Safari's current plans are, what your future plans are, what are you guys building? As I kind of mentioned before we hopped on the recording, I know very little about Safari, admittedly, but I think it's actually, this is a perfect conversation for me to know more. I d- dug into kind of how you guys started, your membership, and now would love to know from a product standpoint or any initiatives that you guys are, are already working on or planning to launch. Yeah, certainly. So what we're, what we're building today is known as marketing attribution. It's a familiar concept to many in the marketing world, but you can think about it most simply as we help companies determine which of the things that they do, aka their marketing channels or anything else, are actually driving revenue for their business. And that's a, a type of understanding that is very, very common in Web2 and so has really not existed at all in Web3 which is uh, wild. to this point, which is, which is crazy, but it, you know, goes back to those bull market vibes. So you didn't really need to know yeah. as long as things are going up, who cares what is, what of the things that you're doing is driving that or driving that result. But now, it, you know, a lot of teams have also downsized, right? So yeah. they can't be doing everything at once anymore. And they really need to think about, you know, okay, we have limited time, limited resources. What are the things that are actually doing what we hope them, hope them to be doing? And so that's what we've been building. We started, we really gained a lot of conviction on this back in like June, July of last year. It become, we had, we'd started off building kind of like a mixed panel for Web3. 
our hypothesis at that time was there are a lot of Web3 growth people like ourselves diving into the space. Dune is very inaccessible for them as like yeah. a tool to analyze on-chain data because they don't know SQL and understanding like the ins and outs of blockchain data tables plagues everybody, mm -hmm. technical people included. And so they needed you know, a better way to be able to visualize and understand their data with no code tools. And what we learned from building that company and, and testing it out with many Web3 teams is that on-chain, while that problem is true, on-chain data alone is not yet actionable for, for Web3 growth leaders. And so we were trying to find what is the combination between on-chain and, and off-chain data that is actionable for growth leaders. And that's what drove us to understand, to think more deeply about attribution, which is simply looking at, you know, which of your web two channels are driving on-chain web three revenue results and be able to stitch those two together. But I think that, you know, as I was mentioning with this evolution of what growth leaders yeah. are willing or not willing to do, I don't think that this business could have been built last year at that time when we were building that mixed panel idea, but now that we're much deeper into the bear market. I think we're, we're very count, Web3 growth is very counter thesis, right? Nobody cares about, about growth in the bull market, but they yeah. really care about it a lot in the bear market. So it's a good time and the right time to be supporting Web3 companies with this type of product. It couldn't have been, obviously technology, technologically could have very easily been built before, but yeah. it wouldn't have been a product that made sense before this. Yeah, you don't know you need it until you need it. And then you're like, okay, now I need some help. How are you guys thinking about, because obviously if we're talking about like more web three native tactics, right? Like in, versus web two, right? Typically web two, you'll do like a paid media campaign through digital media spends through all these different channels. I'm not saying it doesn't happen with web three, but obviously it's a lot less common, particularly for companies that aren't quite at scale. So how are you guys thinking about the customer? segments and, and who you're really working with? Is it larger Web3 companies that are running programmatic, but are Web3 native, or is it kind of more smaller companies and it's more like this Twitter post resulted in these types of things, or how do you guys think about that? Yeah, primarily looking at like mid-size Web3 companies today. Yeah. What we see as sort of the switch is, you know, in Web2, you could be, you could just like spin up a uh, like landing page to like sell coffee beans and then yep. start driving traffic towards it and like get people mm -hmm. to actually buy your thing. In Web3, we see that programmatic and paid media is still for sure going to be needed, yep. but the timing is different. So yep. what we see is once community-like growth is really great in the beginning stages to build that trust with an audience to establish your brand presence. But then yep. after, after you get to a certain point, you basically like that channel saturates, but yep. you need to do it in the beginning to earn that trust, build that credibility. And once you've done that, then you can layer on paid media on top yep. of that. And that is where like, we want to work with companies that have established themselves enough to be known in whatever space they're in and are yep. now ready to like pour fuel on the fire with more performance, like cost per acquisition style marketing to really yeah. get to the next level of growth. So I think that, and I, I imagine we'll continue to see this dynamic play out yeah. is like, you gotta earn your spot and then you can do paid media. And what people were doing before is they're trying to yeah. do the web two playbook, which is like, Hey, we're a new NFT project that no one's ever heard of. Let's like run ads against it. And obviously that didn't, yeah. they hadn't heard their spot yet. Yeah. Yeah. When you see those Twitter ads with like NFT pros, you're like, number one, how'd you pull this off? And number two, no, <laughs> like, if you have to advertise your NFT project on Twitter, you're probably not worth minting in the first place. That actually kind of, that leads me to think about something else. And it's something we're thinking about as well at Lions. And so I'd love to kind of bounce ideas or like thoughts off of you, which is, I mean, even the state of, so it's interesting, right? Because number one, obviously I think what you guys are building is really valuable. Like we want to use it at some point. So we should talk about that separately from, for some of our clients, but then something that I, I think we think about, right, is even when it comes to programmatic and paid media, right? Like there's a lot of ad fraud, tech is going to the roof. Like attribution is really important, of course, but then how are you guys thinking about when you build that layer on top of, and you're bridging those two worlds, and I'm not saying this is your responsibility to solve, but just thinking about, you know, how do you reconcile that, I guess, with the understanding as I think many marketing people, marketing leaders have today which is that this web two traditional kind of digital media programmatic stack, not saying it doesn't work. I mean, it's certainly more expensive and less effective, but it still works. Like, how do you reconcile that? I guess with the fact that, that this is 
evolving and kind of kind of declining industry at the same time and, and how do we reconcile is it we're just we'll build and then as as those you know tides evolve we'll kind of just roll with it and build on top and help shepherd in that new future or how are you guys thinking about it yeah so one i'll start and say i think the ad fraud in some degree will always exist yeah though i think that web3 enables a unique opportunity to better evaluate the traffic yeah. that's coming to your website in a way yeah. that wasn't as possible for just normal traffic for web2 yeah so we already can see this in our platform which is a cool example of yeah. a lot of people during bull market were using influencers to drive yeah. a ton of traffic to their website and they would be looking at maybe if they're using google analytics so many were many more that we'd right. like to admit were actually using google analytics during the bull market to, That's a dirty um, secret. Like half 90% of web three is all built on web two tooling. Yeah. But you know, they would have seen a huge spike in traffic, but yep. maybe not the revenue that they expected. Mm. And so with our tool right now, we can see like you got this many web visitors and then this many people actually connected their wallet. And mm -hmm. what is the conversion rate from web visitor to wallet per channel? Right. So, yep. so you know, we might see from one of your core channels like Twitter, that 30% of the people that arrive on your website connect their wallet versus mm -hmm. a paid influencer campaign might be 1%. So mm -hmm. you might see like, wow, we got a lot of traffic. Uh, but then when you look at the actual people who are connecting their wallet from that channel, you're like, oh, it actually wasn't that great. So mm -hmm. we're actually seeing that this is lower quality traffic. And I think that will that will be a, a key nuance for ad fraud in the future as we think about web two traffic converting into web three, yep. be able to measure things like this to say, it's not just about traffic anymore. One, yep. we can see the people who actually connect their wallet. And then beyond that, we can say of the people who connected their wallet, how many of these were like blank wallets versus yep. someone who had done something. And like for I said, web segmentation visitors, coming. Yeah. Web visitors, you can't, I mean, it's harder to see that we get things about them, but we don't know like how yep. qualified they are as a user per se, as they arrive on your website to potentially buy your product. So I think that these yeah. types of things are where, where ad fraud, I mean, obviously with all types of fraud, once you create a better system, people yeah. find ways to break your system in new ways. Constantly well, whack and mold. That that's, yeah. yeah. I think that's a very interesting development of how we qualify traffic in the future it will change as, as people move from web two to web three. It's going to be interesting. Interesting. But yeah, Justin, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I love how tactful we've gotten and, and appreciate you being able to kind of break down more specific growth challenges because I think what we try and do here is really bring on a diversity of people to talk about different elements. And this is, I thought you would be really great for talking about very specific growth and marketing challenges. But now it's just like zooming out, right? And I think this is something we, we like to kind of ask all your guests is like, when you are thinking about, it's, it's more just a broad general kind of like state of the industry. Right? Like we're in the bear market, mass adoption is still yet to be there. We're still figuring out, as you pointed out, right? All the web three growth hacks and tooling and that the hacks are evolving every three months, like you just said, and the tooling is just now being built. What's your general outlook in terms of, you know, where we're all headed in terms of adoption, you know, on all fronts, whether it's the corporates, the users, all of it, like, how are you feeling? Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just kind of leave it there. Yeah. I mean, my general outlook is still as bullish as ever. Yeah, I will say, I think that many of us, and this is sort of the market intel I hear from many people is they expect 2023 to be a quiet year. But I yeah. think that a lot of the things that needed to get built that didn't get built will get built in 2023, both yeah. in terms of products that launch that help other Web3 companies and also internal tooling that was super necessary for many of these products yeah. in the bull market will also get built. There's so many people that were like, you know, we were operating like we were a series E company, but we were, you know, yeah. internally, we were still a siege state startup, right? Yeah. Like Magic Eden and all these companies, they were at their height eight months after they found it. Right. So oh like this, yeah. people are ready to build up the things that they really need to build out internally. And I think yeah. that's a necessary good break. I expect that we'll see things start to get hot again in certain segments in 2024. Yeah. Probably most acutely with gaming. I think that either early Q1 2024 or sometimes toward the middle of the year, we'll start seeing games launch more and more. There's yep. certainly things that need to be figured out with the in-game economy. So I'm not, you know, I think with the recession and other things, people, even though they probably could launch games in this year, will probably delay until early next year. Yeah. I think that a big question, which we kind of ripped on earlier is like, 
I call it the wallet wars. I think yeah. that the wallet wars will determine our future as Safari and also Web3's future overall is yeah. how are people going to sign into Web3 websites and yeah. what are the like different iterations that make Web3 growth leaders and, and consumers decide one or the other, whether it'll be, you know, we're seeing a lot more app specific wallets yeah. like for Reddit and Starbucks, we're seeing like custodial wallets, like Bitski, non-custodial wallets, like yeah. Ledger, MetaMask, like Google. You know, right now there's so many wallets, so many different chains, but we know just similar to Web2 off, there's not going to be 10 million different options. They're probably going to be like five in the end. Yeah. So which, which five and even what type of wallet is going to win out, I think has a massive impact on the space and probably start seeing those wallet wars begin this okay. year. It'll be more of like an in-industry thing. Yeah. Like, I don't think it's something that's going to like people outside of Web3 are going to be talking about, but I yeah. think that what happens with that will also shape too, like how Web3 games launch in 2024 and who they're for, whether they're for, for Web3 users, whether they're for Web2 users, what mm. the sort of world looks like. Yeah. I also think that there are a lot That's of, right. mm -hmm. I think there'll be new ad opportunities too. I doubt that we're seeing already the emergence of a lot of these Web3 ad networks, yeah. especially, I mean, I've been seeing more and more in the last like two to three months in particular. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see where they buy ad real estate and from who um, yeah. and what is how those campaigns do. We'll be on the front lines figuring out how those campaigns are doing with attribution. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, is it in the metaverse? Is it, it within decentralized applications? Is it on more like crypto media sites like CoinMarketCap? Yeah. Like where are people buying ad in real estate to support these these ad networks or is it on web two platforms just with web three targeting so i think that those are some of the things that we'll, we'll really start seeing emerge as like an experimental testing grounds play out this year but i think it's going to be very in industry like i think oh. that web three is going to go quiet to web two for this year but this is like a great time for people to build their tech stack and get super experimental on what I think will be the channels that really break out in 2024. That's incredible. Yeah. All the fundamentals are going to be built this year yeah. before they hit the masses. Cool. I think on that note, yep. Blake, unless you had anything yep. else. Well, I was just thinking, I mean, I mean, I'm just having so much fun with this, right? So I'm yeah, just go like, for it. I, this is, I know, I feel like you're excited. Where guess what gears going? That's what we think about at Myson, you know, like, I mean, yeah, it's like, so the wallet wars, right? Like, I, I agree with you there. Like, I am curious, like, I feel like there almost definitely will be some kind of wallet aggregator, right? Because at a certain point, like you, like you were talking about, there are different types of wallets. They're different. Like, you know, the way I use my MetaMask versus other, you know, I have the payments one. I have a company one. I have a, a burner one. I have all types, right? And so how do those all fit in? And then it's funny because MetaMask is obviously the market leader, but you know, places like Rainbow and Bitski and they're all trying to compete. But then it's a question of, as you said, I think the one key element to this is we're talking to a lot of Web2 companies and they're all trying to enter this space, right? So then, but even when we talk to some of those, like there, some of them are still trying to do like private blockchains, which I'll be frank from a PO, my personal POV is like bearish private blockchains because the amount of money it's going to require to maintain a blockchain in itself. It's like, you better be committed to maintain this thing for like a thousand years. You don't even know your companies be around for a thousand years. Right. So very bearish on a, like private blockchain, but then it's like as Polygon built, as you said, right. Red has their own Polygon has their own. I guess some of them are using like partners. I think Nike swoosh is using a, a, I don't remember who is their wallet provider, but someone else is doing it. So, but if let's play it out, right. If all these web two corporates have separate ones like that it defeats the whole point of intercompatibility if there's no aggregation layer maybe that's the opportunity i don't know i'm just thinking out loud right how does that sound to you joseph yeah what do you think i mean i totally agree i think that that's the challenge like probably the yeah. easiest to use type of wallet is these app specific you log in with your web 2 on yeah use a credit card you purchase crypto it's all in the stag Technically, you can export those assets to another wallet that's outside of that app. But like, is that really better than like, you'll still have all these different apps. You'll have your own wallet for them. That's kind of just like having, that's in my mind, that's kind of actually worse than our current user web to authentication method. Yeah. So I have 10 million wallets, each wallet for one specific app. And yeah, yeah. be able to export into another wallet. But why would you? 
So I think that that's why I'm thinking about these wall wars. Uh, is the app specific actually better or is it just using like, well, preferably it's web two, preferably it's one, right? But I'm skeptical that like just one is going to win out, right? Cause like MetaMask is a horrible experience, but it already has the majority of the, you know, the market and everyone else competing against it. So I don't know. I think you can, yeah. you can also make a case for, we haven't seen it yet, obviously, but device specific wallets, like mm. when Kalana launches its mobile phone yeah, we're and really excited it theoretically about that. has a wallet embedded within the device itself and then all your applications build off of that. That's very interesting. Yeah, uh, but that's yet another form, right? If we're going to yeah. device specific, app specific, custodial, not custodial. Oh my God. And that's where I think like things will go way crazy. We're already like yeah. on the edge of like, it's getting crazy, can yeah. get even crazier. And then it's going to be like, no, we need to like concentrate this market, which who's going to win out. We can't have four different types. Yeah. Like a million types and a million chains each. It's going to be exciting. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And then we haven't even talked about the, like the L1, you know, like who's going to win there, right? L2s and which blockchains, because like Avalanche is doing well, Solana is doing well, ETH, Polygon. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, listen, this is really awesome. Thanks so much, Justin. I'm really enjoying this, but we, we should wrap it up. So yeah, Julie, if you want to kick off the rapid fire questions, let's, let's take it home. Yeah, totally. So pretty self-explanatory. We will ask, I think we have three or four questions on the docket. As quickly as you possibly can, your immediate answer that comes to mind. So starting off with the first one, what is a Web3 project aside from your own, of course, that you're most bullish on? I actually just chatted with this founder super recently. We've only had one conversation, so I'm going to show it anyway. It's Odin oh. AI. Okay. I don't know if either of you have heard of it. It's a new Web3 ad network. Mm. It is on based on a cost per acquisition model rather than a CPC cost per click model. Yeah. I think that the timing makes sense for this type of ad network of uh, people will only spend if they you know can drive like better predictability, which is where attribution comes into of like, am I actually going to get the result that I'm spending for? So having a, a CPA based model ad network makes a lot of sense. So that's all that I'm very intrigued to see how it'll develop. They're based out of Israel. I'm also seeing a lot of web three growth tooling come out of Israel on the, the marketing side. Web3 marketing, or Web2 marketing was very big in yeah. Israel in the last one. So I think that we'll also start to see a lot of Web3 marketing tools coming out of Israel. And, and I'm already seeing them. That'll Incredible be ecosystem over there. Yeah. Awesome. Next one, biggest professional learning from 2022. Ooh, that one's actually easy for me. I would say it's building a personal brand and mm -hmm. network. I talked to, I never had a personal brand before 2022. I never had a Twitter before 2022. And so this was like, for sure, yeah, investing in that has changed everything for me personally. And people have been telling me for years it would, but I never listened to them. So mm -hmm. this is to everyone listening. This is your reminder to, to do this now, even though you're not going to listen to me either for another few years. Yeah. But you'll be happy when you did is I spoke to more people in this past year than I think I've ever spoken to in my life beforehand. Yeah. I talked to four, around 400 new people Wild. last year. And like when I first dove into the space or like for context, I was like that guy at my, at my previous companies that would like talk to web three growth leaders or talk to growth leaders, to like learn more about my job, but like one per month. And people were like, right. wow, Justin, you're like, blah, blah, blah. like everyone should be like networking more like you and learning from people. Yeah. And that was like 10 people a year. <laughs> wow. And this is like, you know, on a completely different scale and you just learn so much from other people. I mean, yeah. I think that there's such an overload of content on the internet today, but the irony is that most of the great insights out there are still just in the minds of people and will not be written down. And yep. so in order to really up level yourself, you need to talk to other people and as many of them as possible. One to one, That's baby. so interesting. Yeah. One to one. It's worth the time. It sounds like I'm curious. From a personal standpoint, when you're saying grow your personal brand, in addition to talking to others, and I think you mentioned you didn't have Twitter or whatever it was, is it also like an outward facing, like getting on all those socials, tweeting out your thoughts? Because that is something that I am seriously slacking in. And I'm like, I should probably do this because we're in, we're, we have our boots in the ground and, you know, we're in this like developmental stage of the industry. So yeah, obviously talking to picking people's brains, as many people's brains as you can, of course. But how did you find that being active, outwardly facing active, you know, have you joined certain, I know this isn't a rapid fire question, but wondering, have you been more active with like, you know, panels or conferences and, and like I said, social media, like how has that affected everything? Yeah. 
I think that one thing for those listening to or, or take into account is you should really focus on one channel, one distribution channel that you care about it. I think that a lot of people try to do like, I'm going to be active on LinkedIn and YouTube and like all the things at once. And that's actually like super hard and time consuming, I think for all creators. So I focus just on Twitter. The way I got started was I would read long form articles that I was already reading, and then I'd summarize them as threads on Twitter. And that was just also a great output for my personal learning as I was exploring yep. and getting into Web3 in the space. And it turned out other people appreciated that too. They could, you know, read articles in a lot less time and get the information that they wanted. So I think that it's those things. Now I post way less than I did before now that I'm like deep in the throes of being a full-time founder, but I still try and, you know, summarize, you know, write a thread maybe like once a month on the things that I'm learning and people seem to appreciate that too. And that also creates new connection opportunity for conversations that I have and also business that comes my way as a result. You're the second guest we've had on the show that has said that. Stick to one channel, yep. give it your all and uh, just start somewhere. Even, you know, like you said, a summarizing a, a read that you, you you're reading anyways might as well just like take the extra time to summarize it so i think that's super interesting last second to last one if you had one million dollars let's just say like usd usdc what would you go build in web3 today again outside of you know your own project yeah i'll probably feel from the answer that i i was talking about before i think that uh, the next best thing if i weren't building attribution would be to build an ad network so that would be the thing that I would probably go to build. Blake, you want to round it out with the last one? Yeah. Well, it's funny. I think it kind of ties into the last thing we talked about, which is just craziest predictions for in the year 2023. Like by this time, or may, I guess beginning of 2024, right? Like crazy thoughts. I don't know, spitball. Like where do you think we'll be this time next year in terms of like crazy events that have happened by that point? I don't know. I'm... I feel like I, I shared the thing that I, I really do feel, which yeah. is that it, this year will be an internal year for many people. It will be a lot more experimentation, a lot more internal building. It probably won't look that crazy mm. on the outside, but it'll be, I think, the most important year of Web3 yeah. to date will be this year. This is the year where people figure out whether they're building a real business first. Other people actually want to buy the thing that they're building. They'll figure out how to build the internal tooling that they've so desperately been looking for to be able to build those businesses. And they'll be experimenting on a lot of new, interesting channels, trying to figure out what works ahead of the next bull market so that they can say, cool, we learned X, Y, Z about these new channels, and now we're ready to pour fuel on the fire as, yeah. as that all comes into place. But this is the time where people will be investing in the long-term strategies that they didn't have the luxury of yeah. investing in, in the bull market. They're going to start working on SEO. They're going to do all these things that made no sense in the bull market. But yeah. now is the perfect time to start building out these like defensible growth strategies yeah. that have real staying power. Set the foundations, baby. You know, set the yeah. foundations. On that note, maybe 2024 will be the year that we start seeing the Web2 no. brand. I mean, I feel like right now it's a, it's a trickle of Web2 entering Web3, but I think no. based on what you're saying, it sounds like 2024 will be the big year. All the foundation is set up and all the big guys will probably be either in or about to come in. And if not, they'll definitely be coming in in 2024. They're already experimenting. They, want, they all want to learn. So that's kind of where my is focus. And that's what we're, that's yeah. what we're hearing. And I think the tooling yeah. needs to be a little bit better too. Yeah. I think that yeah. Web2 brands are what we see as they're coming to agencies like Myosin and saying, we don't understand, do it all for us, right? Which is great. This is like yeah. what's super needed now. Yeah. But by 2024, I hope that we're able to say, hey, you guys can do it yourself with this tool, right? And then they go, right? But that doesn't exist today. And once that sort of tooling and maturity of the internal work has been done, when Web2 brands can self-serve ape into Web3, then that's when things really start to, to move the needle and shift. It's going to be major. Let's go do the hard work. Let's go better. <laughs> well, I think on that note, that brings us to the end of this conversation of this episode. So as Blake said, I'll, I'll reiterate, thank you so much for yeah. joining Justin. This was an extremely valuable conversation. I learned a lot. I had fun just sitting back watching you guys go back and forth, especially around the predictions of what's to come, yeah. the wallet wars and all that. 
So yeah, thank you for the time and uh, all the insights. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun. Oh, and good. then before we forget, we'd like to wrap up the episode again, allowing you to show yourself where can we find you? Where oh, yeah, we find of course, Safari. always. Give us all the, the, the links, the websites, the Twitter handles for our, our listeners to find you guys and join the community. Yep. So I'm you fly. can find me, myself, at on Twitter. Primarily, it's J-K-E-Y underscore E-T-H. Harkens back to I had started as an Anon for my first seven months in the space, yeah. which is also a great way to start sharing your thoughts without it feeling too personal. And the way that you can find Safari is Safari is S-A-F-A-R-Y. So why not an I dot club. And that's our website where you can learn more about our attribution products and also about our community. Oh, yeah. Sounds great. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again. I'm sure we'll be speaking soon. Nice this meeting is, you. This is really fun, man. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And uh, I'll see you soon. Maybe in Denver. Yeah. In Breckenridge. We'll talk. I, I hope so. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. And then I'll meet you in person as well. <laughs> there you go. Julie will be there. All right. Looking forward to it. All right. Have Until then, y'all. Have a you good too. one. Bye. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of W3G. If you'd like to learn more about Web3 marketing, please visit myson.xyz to get started. And of course, if you're a fan of the show, please be sure to show us your support by subscribing and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you're using to tune in. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.